Uh, so welcome everyone. My name's Les Allen. I'm the facil facilitator of um, Philosophy Matters. And our speaker tonight is Tim Harding. He will be speaking on scepticism, philosophical or scientific. And what will it be about? Tim describes the talk like this. Dictionaries often draw a distinction between the modern common meaning of scepticism and its traditional philosophical meaning, which dates from antiquity. The usual common dictionary definition is as a skeptical attitude, doubt as to the truth of something, end of quote. Whereas the philosophical definition is, quote, the theory that some or all types of knowledge are impossible, end of quote. These definitions are, of course, quite different and reflect the fact that the meanings of, of some philosophical terms have drifted over the millennia. The contemporary meaning of scientific skepticism is different again which Tim will also discuss. He has a foot in both the scientific and philosophical camps. Although Tim will be speaking mainly about the less familiar philosophical scepticism, he personally supports scientific scepticism over philosophical scepticism for reasons he will explain. So a little about Tim himself. Tim Harding has studied the history and philosophy of science twice at the same institution, Monash University. The first time was as an elective subject in a science degree where he majored in biochemistry and microbiology. The second time was 40 years later studying for an arts degree where he majored in philosophy and history. In the intervening period, he worked as an environmental scientist, regulator and senior public servant. Later on, he worked as a regulatory consultant to the federal government and various state governments specialising in agriculture, animal welfare, and public safety. Tim, Tim is currently an administrator of the Large Skeptics in Australia Facebook group. And I also learned tonight, Tim is a masterful trombone player, and he's been playing trombone and other musical instruments for decades. So let me hand over to Tim. Thank you, Tim. Hello, everybody. I'd like to thank Les for uh, inviting me to give this talk. As Les says, I've got a background in both science and philosophy, and this is a rare opportunity to talk about both subjects together. My talk is based on an essay published in the Skeptic magazine of March 2017 under the title, I Think I Am. Now I'm aware that this audience is different to the skeptics audience. And although some of you may already be familiar with epistemology and uh, philosophical scepticism, <laughs> others might not be. So I'll assume no prior knowledge of these topics. So what's the scepticism thing that everybody's, some people are going on about? Um, the word scepticism is often misunderstood in the general community, both unwittingly through definitional confusion that I'll talk about, and, but also wittingly <laughs> through trying to make uh, denialism more publicly acceptable. A possible contrib contributor to the confusion is there are now three different meanings of the term. So what I'd like to talk about today, that's the title of my talk. I'd like to talk about four things. Firstly, why is the difference between scientific and philosophical scepticism important? I'd like to talk about ancient Greek scepticism, where the word came from. Modern philosophical scepticism dating from Rene Descartes. And scientific scepticism, which I'd like to finish on. So, Here's a typical dictionary definition. As Les mentioned earlier, there's two meanings often given. Firstly, a, a skeptical attitude, doubt as to the truth of something. And secondly, the philosophical definition that the theory that certain knowledge is impossible. And that the philosophical definition, as Les says, does date from the antiquity, the ancient Greeks. 
By way of a preview of philosophical skepticism, this quote comes from Professor Miguel de, de Uno Muno. I always have trouble with that. He was a famous uh, Spanish writer and philosopher regarded as a national treasure in Spain. I'll talk a bit more about that later. One of the current uh, areas of confusion, I suppose, that we often encounter in the skeptical movement is the difference between skepticism and denialism. Denialism, I think, is a, is a person's choice to deny certain particular facts. It's basically an irrational belief where the substitute person substitutes his own personal opinion for established knowledge. And science and denialism is the rejection of basic facts and concepts are disputed, that are undisputed, will support parts of the scientific consensus on a subject in favor of radical and controversial opinions of an unscientific nature. So in science denialism, we're talking about the, uh, for example, the denial of evolution, um, promotion of creationism against evolution, the denial of climate change, vaccination, those sorts of things. And often the denialism feeds into cons conspiracy theories. And the basic format, logical format of these conspiracy fallacies is that a, a, a denialist holds a certain belief. The scientific evidence is inconsistent with their belief. So the way they resolve this inconsistency is to think that scientists are compiring with a big bad government uh, to fake the evidence and undermine their beliefs. Now, let's talk about the ancient Greek um, philosophy schools, which is where skepticism originally came from. What happened was that the Hellenistic period covers the period of Greek and Mediterranean history between the death of Alexander the Great in 323 BC and the Roman victory over the Greeks at the Battle of Corinth in 146 BC. The beginning of this period also coincides with the death of the great philosopher, logician and scientist Aristotle, who was actually the tutor of Alexander the Great. Not many people know that. Um, as he had no adult heir, Alexander's empire was divided between the families of three of his generals. And this resulted in political conflicts and civil wars in which the prominent philosophers and other intellectuals did not want to take sides in the interests of self-preservation. So they retreated from public life into various cloistered schools of philosophy, the main ones being the Stoics, the Epicureans, and the Skeptics. The four different schools. These philosophical schools were different theories as to how to achieve eudaimonia, which roughly translates as the highest human good or the full fulfillment of human life. They thought that the key to eudaimonia was to live in accordance with nature, but they had different views as to how to achieve that. Just in a nutshell, the Stoics advocated development of self-control and fortitude as a means of overcoming destructive emotions. The Epicureans regarded the absence of pain or suffering as a source of happiness. And there's a misunderstanding here. Epicureanism was not just about hedonistic pleasure. The cynics, which means dog-like, rejected conventional desires for wealth, poverty, health, or fame, and lived a simple life free from possessions. Lastly, were the skeptics, which I'll now discuss in more detail. During this uh, Hellenistic period, there were actually two varieties of skepticism. There was academic skepticism and Pyrrhonism. Firstly, academic skepticism. Asilus became the head of the Platonic Academy after Plato. He didn't, didn't doubt the truth of the existence of truth and self, only our capacities for attaining it. 
he thought that knowledge is impossible, nothing can be known at all. And I'd just like to clarify, he, he wasn't arguing that no, there's, there's nothing that we can be certain of, there's that just simply that knowledge was, any form of knowledge was not possible. Later, Carnides refined this and, and thought that ideas or notions are never true, but they're probable. There are degrees of probability, hence degrees of belief, leading to degrees of justification for action. Ac academic skepticism actually died out in the first century CE. It never really caught on for reasons I'll explain next. Piro of Ellis is the father of, uh, thought to be the father of philosophical skepticism, or at least the, the form of philosophical skepticism that that endured, and still endured today, actually. He was born on the west side of the Peloponnese, near where the Olympics were held. He traveled with Alexander Great on his exploration of the east, and he even went as far as the Magi in Persia and the gym, gymnosophists in India. So what was he on about? He thought Nothing can be known for certain. He, th he thought that he can know things, but not for certain. So you could still have knowledge, but it wasn't for certain. That was the difference. Because he thought the statement or the proposition that nothing can be known at all is dogmatic. It's a statement of certainty in itself. And it's a contradiction. He thought our senses are easily filled and reason follows too easily our desires. He argued that we should withhold assent from non-evident propositions and remain in a state of perpetual inquiry. And then Sextus Empiricus in promoted Pironi, Pironi, oh, I'm having trouble here, Pironian skepticism. Now, Empiricus, it's thought to be possible that his name was where the word empirical comes from, but um, there's also other views about that. So Pyrrhonism actually became a synonym for skepticism as late as the 17th century in Europe. So this question, skeptic or skeptic, do we spell it with a C or a K? Well, the thing is that, um, Skepticism originated in Greece, where it was spelt with a K. It comes from the early Greek skeptikos, meaning inquiring or reflective. And spelling it with C dates from Roman times. And um, French being a, uh, a Latin language dating from Roman. Uh, the word French word skeptique was used and that was passed into English after the uh, Norman invasion. As we know, a lot of English words adopted uh, French words. So the British tend to use the skeptic with a C, whereas the Americans being a bit, um, well, they, they like to differentiate their spelling and their vocabulary and whatever from the British, they have spelled it with a K. So I actually think that, uh, that the Greek origin of skepticism has a better claim to fame than with a K than the Roman one, because the Romans were actually not renowned for skepticism at all, or even much philosophy. They were primarily engineers and inventors in their intellectual work. And they're actually, the Romans were actually very superstitious. Uh, and they were into a lot of uh, what we would call, skeptics would call quackery and woo. Just to give a couple of examples, they thought that cabbage, the Romans thought that cabbage had mystical and magical properties. I won't read all that out, but uh, they thought that ca cabbage could cure a lot of illnesses. <laughs> Um, in veterinary treatments. Now, just focus on the word three here. This is a basically superstitious belief in the word magical properties of the word three. 
if you do three of everything, it has some sort of magical property. I'll just give that as a couple of examples. There's a lot of other examples of Roman superstition, but I'm just arguing that I think the Greeks have got a better case for the origins of skepticism than the Romans. That's all I'm saying. Now, knowledge. Since uh, skepticism is a epistemic position, it basically relates to a position about knowledge. So before we talk about either philosophical or scientific skepticism, we should talk briefly about knowledge. Now the traditional definition of knowledge from Plato, um, which is still widely accepted with some exceptions, like such as Gettier problems that Les mentioned earlier on, but basically uh, knowledge can be defined as something that has three properties. First, it's a belief that's true. Um, and secondly, we're justified in believing that it's true. That if we have a belief that's true just by chance, such as uh, I believe there's a, there's a coin in my pocket. I don't really know there's a coin in a pocket. I just have this belief. I have to be justified in believing there's a coin in my pocket. Either I put it there or somebody else put it there. A belief that's purely by coincidence or chance wouldn't qualify as knowledge. So generally in philosophy, there are two broad different types of knowledge. There's a priori knowledge, which is knowledge that is known independently of experience, such as all crows are birds. It's by definition, it's impossible to have a crow that's not a bird. A posteriori knowledge is knowledge is known by experience that all crows, crows are black. We know that all crows are black because that's what we observe through empirical knowledge. It's possible for a crow not to be black either by, you could have an albino crow. I don't know whether there are any, but it's possible. Um, or you could have a red crow, for all I know, some sort of genetic aberration. So the statement, the proposition that all crows are black is an empirical statement. Right. So modern philosophical scepticism is generally thought to date from Descartes, René Descartes, and he conducted some uh, meditations or philosophical thought experiments and he started with the view that the only kind of knowledge of which he can be certain and of course he had the famous cogito I think therefore I am and he thought well I can I can be certain of that because um, unless I existed I couldn't think and then he tried to he was a mathematician so he tried to build up sort of a body of certain knowledge from that as the foundation David Hume, in contrast, thought that he, all human knowledge is ultimately founded in experience, which is a different view. Immanuel Kant only thought that only knowledge gained from empirical science is legitimate. But he did talk about knowledge from reason as well, but he thought, ultimately thought that empirical science is the only source of legitimate knowledge as well. So now we come to scientific scepticism. And this quote comes from Miguel de Uno Muno in 1924, who was professor of philosophy, uh, literature and philosophy in uh, the University of Salamanca in Spain. And there's a statue to him too. Also, I saw a movie recently about him. He was regarded as a bit of a national treasure in Spain. And the, the, the movie is called Why We're at War. And it was about the, the start of the Spanish Civil War and how he, he broke from uh, Franco, who he actually knew quite well, and then uh, broke from him. So we have a, since 1924, there's been a, a skeptics movement that has developed. Um, in 1976, 
there was the formation of the Committee for Skeptical Quiry, which was previously known as uh, SCICOP, much longer name, which focused on uh, testable paranormal and pseudoscientific claims, leaving religious questions to others. It was founded by a professor of philosophy in New York called Paul Kurtz. And he actually was inspired by a Belgian group called the uh, Comte, Belgian Comte, which started up after the Second World War because he became a bit outraged that there were these uh, psychics and paranormals who were charging money to try and find missing people who had been missed in the war and very often they'd been killed in the war. And he thought this was pretty bad and uh, uh, that's how the modern sceptical movement started actually in Belgium after the war. So 1976 it was formalised with this Committee of Sceptical Inquiry, we're still going. And there are now hundreds of sceptics groups around the world. And we've got dozens in Australia. Now the main one, and the first big one was the Australian Skeptics that formed in 1980 by Dick Smith. Dick Smith uh, funded a visit to Australia by James Randi. I think Philip Adams might have funded it as well. Both gentlemen were fairly well off. <laughs> and uh, they brought out James Randi and the Australian Skeptics Inc was formed. Since that is now, it originally started in Melbourne, it's now based in Sydney, but we also have Victorian Skeptics Inc, of which I'm a member. Uh, and, but the other thing is we have a large number of reasonable groups, or not large number, dozens. But we also have online groups, such as the one I'm the admin of, Skeptics in Australia. I'll talk a bit about that later. So Australian Skeptics Inc. runs the annual Skeptical Conference, usually in cooperation with other skeptical groups, such as the Victorian Skeptics. They have a $100,000 challenge for anybody who under, test, who under test conditions can demonstrate the existence of paranormal or psychic phenomena. And it's never been claimed. Um, there's, a, there's a million dollar challenge, similar million dollar challenge operating in America. Also, never been claimed successfully. There've been attempts, but nobody has ever demonstrated under test conditions, the existence of psychic or paranormal phenomena. So how do we define scientific skepticism? There's a couple of definitions. It is different from philosophical skepticism, but the idea was inspired by it. Firstly, there's a defini definition I quite like by Daniel Loxton. I'll read it out. The practice or project of studying paranormal and pseudoscientific claims through the lens of science with critical scholarships, then sharing the results with the public. So that definition um, also includes skepticism being a movement. It's an activity and it's a movement. It's not just a, an e epistemic position. The other one I like is by a prominent uh, scientific skeptic, um, Stephen Novella, who's actually a neuroscientist and very active in the United States. Scientific skeptics maintain that empirical investigation of reality leads to the truth and that the scientific method is best suited to this purpose. Lastly, we have the Skeptics in Australia group that I'm the admin of, and this is our definition for the purpose of this group. Skepticism is not defined as a simple rejection of an idea, but rather as scientific skepticism, which is the practice or questioning of whether claims are supported by empirical research and have reproduci reproducibility as part of a methodological norm pursuing the extension of certified knowledge. This is based on the idea that empirical investigation of reality leads to the truth and scientific method is best suited to this purpose. Now, 
before um, opening up for questions and comments, I forgot to explain why um, I'm not a philosophical skeptic. I left that out. So I'll just mention that now. My own view is that both a priori and a posterior knowledge are possible. A priori knowledge is possible through logic, reasoning and mathematics. And a posterior knowledge is possible through science. So in other words, I'm not a philosophical skeptic. Um, biological um, structure known as Merton Tollens, we have scientific knowledge. Uh, I, my view is that we do have scientific knowledge. Therefore, at least some forms of knowledge must be possible, such as scientific knowledge. Thanks, Tim, for a really good rundown on the two different versions of scepticism. I really like the way you draw the distinctions and the commonalities between scientific scepticism and, um, and philosophical scepticism. To access other videos and podcasts in this series, go to the Philosophy Resources section of the Rational Realm website at www rationalrealm.com